A lot of that is revealing what the truth of your connection is and not trying to force it to be something in particular because, you know, if you care about someone or you like someone, you're attracted to them, you usually want a particular outcome, but that can steer something in a wrong direction that it's not supposed to become just because, you know, you have that motivation there. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the show today. We drop great content each and every week, and we want to make sure that you guys get notified. And in order to do that, you're going to have to smash that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And if you've gotten a lot of value out of this, make sure you give us a like and share our videos with your friends. What had piqued my curiosity and why we wanted to bring you on is you put out a video. And if I get the title wrong, please correct me. But it was 10 ways neuroticism shows up in men. And in AJ and I's work in the last 15 years of running live programs, we had given all of our clients a personality test, which is ocean, which is used in psychology, at least for the, for the best of everyone's ability to establish personality types. And neuroticism usually from us sending it out had come up very high in our clients. But that's also the amount of folks who are willing to admit th that they have some neuroticism. And one of the things that, that I enjoyed about your video was we have to first admit that it, we all display signs of our neuroticism and it's on a scale. And if we can perhaps destigmatize the word itself and discuss it, that more people will be able to come to terms with some of these, these, uh, these, the way they exhibit it, and then go ahead and start to work on getting better at it. Yes, and it's not all bad, right? There are adaptive elements to having these traits and you can be both neurotic and also very confident and sort of wield it in a way that it's quite, I don't, I don't know, like quirky in a cute way, you know what I mean? There's a lot of high powered people that are fully embracing their neuroticism and it's what's made them successful. So it's definitely not like an exclusive quality to being insecure and timid and unsuccessful. I think for a lot of our clients in their professional career, it pays off to be neurotic, to be highly motivated, to be self-analytical, to show up in a lot of the ways that we're gonna talk about here. But when it comes to interpersonal relationships and really having the trust in your actions and the way people are responding to you, it creates a real barrier to creating successful relationships, both romantically and socially. I just wanna point this out as, as well. We are, we're now living in a post Seinfeld world. And when I say that, I mean that these, these cute little traits that we find interesting or curious or attractive about somebody at the beginning of dating tend to get more and more, uh, how we say, they go from cute to frustrating and then to unattractive. There is a cycle there. And so, the, the other thing is about when, once we can identify these, these troubled areas that stop us from connecting, we're able to start working on them and getting them under control so that they remain cute. They remain quirks, as, as you were saying. Yes, I think it, you know when it comes to getting to know somebody, they can just really be the clutter in the way of connection. So it's really important to be able to clarify, you know, your communication and the way that you are interacting with someone, so that you can get to the truth of what that is, right? Like I see vetting, and you know, people call it dating, but vetting is really the getting to know you stage. A lot of that is revealing what the truth of your connection is and not trying to force it to be something in particular because you know if you care about someone or you like someone you're attracted to them you usually want a particular outcome but that can steer something in a wrong direction that it's not supposed to become just because you know you have that motivation there so i think overthinking will just make that job even more difficult because <laughs> you've got all this clutter in the way. Now, Johnny and I are very familiar with the work that you do, but I'd love for you to explain a little bit about yourself and your background for our audience as we kick things off. 
Sure. Uh, I'm a retired mental health counselor and a retired marriage and family therapist. So my PhD is in marriage and family counseling. And when I retired my licenses, I just wanted to work online independently. And so it's it's very different work and uh, it allows me to work location independently, globally with anybody. And I've really augmented what I learned formally with a lot of my own sort of autodidactic knowledge that I've acquired in my own life experience and personality and just being more directive and more like a mentor to my clients. So they seek me out because they align with my values and we can really get straight to the work rather than spending a lot of time building trust. They already trust me, so it's great. Uh, I really like this this type of work that I've been doing. So I focus on mostly, I would say, singles, although I do work with couples as well, because the vetting system is really a whole life paradigm shift. It's applicable in all facets of life. So my book, The Vetting System, is, is not geared towards married or, or coupled people, but it definitely applies. And so people who want to prevent a disastrous type of relationship that they have to either totally fix and transform or extricate themselves from really want to learn how to spot <laughs> the, the things that matter in a partner so that you know who to invest in and how to escalate you know, a relationship as it grows. So I really reframe uh, people or the process of dating as reserved for after you have more clarity around what your intentions are. And vetting is more so the very beginning stages as you're getting to know someone. We drop great content each and every week and we want to make sure that you guys get notified. And in order to do that, you're going to have to smash that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And if you've gotten a lot of value out of this, make sure you give us a like and share our videos with your friends. Yeah, and we all know in dating, especially in the online dating world, that many of us will present a great first impression, a very curated social media feed. And then as we start to get to know someone, the more time spent with them, we let our hair down, the honeymoon phase is over, and a lot of these neurotic tendencies that we're gonna talk about start to showcase themselves. And unfortunately, what a lot of our clients struggle with is when these signs are present, the other person loses interest, but the other person isn't often gonna be able to articulate exactly why they're losing interest. And a highly neurotic person is going to seek out those answers because they want to know exactly what it was that push the other person away and what it maybe could be that they can improve. And in actuality, that just creates a vicious cycle that hurts them even more and turns the other person off. And we see this in a lot of our clients who come to us saying, well, I did everything you guys talk about. I followed everything to a T and she's not responding to my messages. She doesn't want to go on a third date with me. I can't figure it out. And this is a repeat pattern now with multiple potential partners. And what can be very frustrating is there isn't that closed feedback loop. It's just the other person loses interest, can't articulate it, and they're gone from your life. And you're kind of left wondering, well, how do I pick up the pieces? How do I improve? And it can be a very frustrating process. Yeah, I hear that a lot. So that's definitely common from my, my camp as well. And I think too, you know, when people are overthinking things, it's like they don't recognize that the other person can probably be <laughs> a little bit neurotic themselves. And so instead of having empathy for the other person and maybe thinking the best, they always go to the worst case scenario. But, you know, I, I think it's it's obviously it's something that affects your in, in, your entire life. So it's you want to get a, a grip on these if it's anxieties, insecurities, self-doubt, self-consciousness, just ruminative thinking, you know, where you're like what ifing scenarios constantly, that's going to slow you down across the board. So it, it, it behooves you to attend to this and try to clarify and create more effective self-talk and thinking patterns. So we've kind of danced around it, and Johnny and I know it quite well, but I'd love to start with just defining neuroticism. As we said at the beginning, it gets a bad rap. Many people would not want to self-identify as neurotic for exactly that Seinfeld example. But what is neuroticism? How does it show up in our personality? A lot of times, I mean, it's just easy to think about it as overthinking. <laughs> so you're overanalyzing things, you're... I guess it's like very exhaustive 
uh, analysis, like analysis paralysis, insecurities, self-consciousness that puts you at the, the center of every bad scenario, basically taking the blame, internalized blame for things, always making things about you, thinking other people are thinking bad things about you. And yeah, I think it's trying too hard as well. A lot of people just really want to project an image that they think will make a good impression rather than just being present and being their best self in the moment. So it's it's basically a way that you take yourself out of your body and you're just really residing in your brain <laughs> and, and that's not effective. So you really need to have that integrated sense of self where you're connecting your body, your mind, your spirit, and you're able to flow more naturally between them and not sort of hyper-focus or obsess about your thinking. Interesting, and I think that's where it plays a role anytime that there is clutter in the middle of that integration between all of those is where the, the hiccups are and that's where it shows up. And for those who are listening to this, who are still not convinced that they show any of these traits, we should go through them because even for myself and watching your video, I was like, oh, I, I do that from time to time or oh, I, I recognize when I do this. So I think we should go through them and talk about how these things manifest themselves. Okay, well, I don't know if you have the notes in front of you. I don't have any notes in front of me. <laughs> I, I, I do, so okay. we can go through. All the, I, um, so the, the first one was restlessness and impatience. Yeah, I think people are very um, fast-paced. They expect results right away, and then they assume that things are reflecting something negative about them when it could just be totally irrelevant, like some kind of external thing is happening. And if you just, uh, if you're able to see the bigger picture, step back, slow down, <laughs> right? Like it, I think it's, it's a lot easier to come to some kind of constructive conclusion about whatever event you're analyzing. But when it comes to restless behaviors, like twitches and stuff, you know, you'll notice people might be hyperactive, hypervigilant, they're fidgety. And so they're constantly moving. And, and it's a lot of the, the things that I'm talking about are connected. Like I did a recent video on the four stress languages too. And I talked about the, the flight response. And so when you're feeling emotionally overwhelmed, right, the stress is really high. The flight response is about being overactive and restless. So you're gonna be running away from those scenarios where you have to be intimate with someone because it kind of puts you on the spot and makes you confront something and you're not you're not prepared for it or you're not ready for it. So then you start maybe talking fast, you, you wanna leave, you feel suffocated or trapped. And so they're very related. That person who's feeling restless is, might throw themselves into work, you know, just occupy their time in an obsessive way kind of procrastinating doing something else, you know, like if you're procrastinating dealing with one thing by doing something else. So it can be rewarded, which is part of the adaptive part element of it, right? Like when you're restless, sometimes you can end up doing something, something positive, but not necessarily what you're supposed to be doing by having the conversation with the person. Absolutely. And we see it in our clients and, and much like yourself working with high achievers, this restlessness, this impatience will often lead to breakthroughs in your career, will lead to you tossing and turning until you find the solution. But that impatience with others, when it, we're talking about interpersonal relationships, will lead to you searching out YouTube videos, searching out the art of charm, following whatever model is available to you and then getting quickly frustrated when you don't get that result as fast as you would like. You don't get that date. You don't get that girlfriend. You don't get that boyfriend as fast as you would like. And of course, that impatience, I'd love to talk about how it feels on the other side. So for someone who's experiencing you being impatient, it does show a sign of lack of confidence, a lack of actual need for connection with the other person, making it about yourself. And that's very off-putting. That's very unattractive when we're talking about a romantic relationship. 